Welcome. You may think you know about Martin Luther King Jr., but there is much about the man and his message we have conveniently forgotten. He was a prophet, like Amos, Isaiah, and Jeremiah of old, calling kings and plutocrats to account, speaking truth to power. Yet, he was only 39 when he was murdered in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4, 1968. The March on Washington in 63 and the March from Selma to Montgomery in 65 were behind him. So was passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. In the last year of his life, as he moved toward Memphis and fate, he announced what he called the Poor People's Campaign, a multiracial army that would come to Washington, build an encampment, and demand from Congress an economic bill of rights for all Americans, black, white, or brown. He had long known that the fight for racial equality could not be separated from the need for economic equity, fairness for all, including working people and the poor. That's why he was in Memphis marching with sanitation workers on strike for a living wage when he was killed. With me are two people steeped in King's life and work. Taylor Branch wrote the extraordinary three-volume history of the Civil Rights era, America in the King Years. The first of them, Parting the Waters, received the Pulitzer Prize. He now has distilled all that work, adding fresh material and insights to create this new book, The King Years, Historic Moments in the Civil Rights Movement. James Cone, a longtime professor of theology at New York's Union Theological Seminary, wrote the groundbreaking books that defined Black Liberation Theology, Interpreting Christianity Through the Eyes and Experience of the Oppressed. Among them, Black Theology and Black Power, Martin and Malcolm in America, and this most recent bestseller, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Before we talk, let's listen to these words from Martin Luther King Jr. spoken at Stanford University just a year before his assassination. It's as if he were saying them today. There are literally two Americas. One America is beautiful for situation. And in a sense, this America is overflowing with the milk of prosperity and the honey of opportunity. And this America is the habitat of millions of people who have food and material necessities for their bodies, and culture and education for their minds, and freedom and human dignity for their spirits. But tragically and unfortunately, there is another America this other America has a daily ugliness about it that constantly transforms the buoyancy of hope into the fatigue of despair. In this America, millions of work-starved men walk the streets daily in search for jobs that do not exist. In this America, millions of people find themselves living in rat-infested, vermin-filled slums. In this America, people are poor by the millions, and they find themselves perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. Welcome to you both. Thank you. So as he was trying to converge economics, race, uh, social and political equality, what was he struggling for at that time when he, alone among his colleagues, wanted to take on the tough structure of prejudice and economics in the North? I think he was thinking about class issues. He talked about class issues to his staff. He didn't do it primarily in his speeches because of the kind of anti-communism spirit that was so deep in America at that time. But uh, on many occasions, he, he talked about, um, um, uh, about the economic and about America having 40 million people who are in poverty in the richest country in the world. 
He was talking about restructuring everything. And if you talk about restructuring, you're talking about class too. Yes, you got to have to understand that some of this class tension was also within the black community. That's right. Some of King's most stinging speeches were to the members of his own like Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity mm -hmm. saying you spend more money on liquor at your annual convention than you contribute to the NAACP. Um, this is, we're more concerned about, uh, I know ministers who are more concerned about the wheelbase on their Cadillac than they are the spiritual base of their commitment to this world. Mm -hmm. So King drew an awful lot of, of, of sustenance and biting challenge from the basic notions of uh, I think that his favorite parable was the parable of Lazarus and Dives in Luke about Which, uh, not noted. It, it was about the rich man who passed Lazarus begging at his door and, and didn't notice him uh, and went to hell um, and saw Lazarus up in heaven. And King interpreted this thing as saying Lazarus, the, the rich man did not go to hell because he was rich. He, d he yeah. went there because he didn't notice the humanity of the man he was passing at his gate and that it was about humanity. Remember the, the, how the, the sanitation strike started. It started because two members of the, the, the sanitation force were crushed in the back of a garbage truck that was a cylinder, one of those compacting cylinders in a, in a torrential rainstorm and they were not allowed by the city to seek shelter in storms um, because the white residents didn't like it. If, if the black garbage men stopped, all the garbage uh, workers were black. And so they weren't allowed, the only place they could get shelter and they wouldn't all fit in the cabin. So the ones that could fit in the cabin and two of them had to climb in the back with the garbage and uh, a broom fell on the lever and it compacted them with the garbage. And that is the origin of the slogan, I am a man, yeah. I am a man, not a piece of garbage. And that's, that connects to King's philosophy. It and the sanitation man. workers carried those signs, remember, I am a man. I am yeah. a man. And to them, that was about Echo Cole and Robert Walker, their two friends who had been literally crushed with the garbage and nobody noticed. And King is saying, you're going to go to hell as a nation if you don't notice the humanity of Echo Cole and Robert Walker. And, and that's why justice is so central for King and why poverty became the focus of his ministry after that civil rights and voting rights. Uh, because the civil rights and voting rights is not going get to get rid of poverty. And so King, King, King saw that as central. Let's listen again to Dr. King from the speech he made to those striking sanitation workers in Memphis just weeks before he was shot to death. What he said about poverty still rings true. Do you know that most of the poor people in our country are working every day? They are making wages so low that they cannot begin to function in the mainstream of the economic life of our nation. These are facts which must be seen. And it is criminal to have people working on a full-time basis and a full-time job getting part-time income. Could anything be more current right now? No, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine and, and of course it's chilling to think what the distribution of wealth was uh, when he made that indictment compared to what it is now. It is much more skewed now than it was then and, and, and it was bad then. So you really get a sense of, of, of King's power. I, I would only caution that we, not, that we not assume that he took, undertook these issues of poverty only late in his career. It was part of his message all along. Certainly if you look at the Nobel Prize lecture uh, in 1964, he says, we are, we are, the world is seeing the widest liberation in human history, not just in the United States, but around the world. And we cannot lose this opportunity to apply it, its nonviolent power, to the triple scourge of race, war, and poverty, what he called violence of the flesh and violence of the spirit. This was a very, very broad vision early on. It's only at the end of his career 
that he's making witness on that because he sees his time limited uh, and, and he wants to leave that witness. Uh, he made a, a wonderful quote when he was arguing with his staff about doing the Poor People's Campaign, and most of them didn't want to do it. He quoted something saying, at times you must finish with what you have, even if it's only a little. You remind me that the famous March on Washington five years earlier in 1963 wasn't called the March on Washington. No, no. It was a march for jobs, jobs. and freedom, and which, freedom. And which yeah. goes back to his early concern, as you say. Actually, actually, you know, King grew up as he was a child during the Depression, and he saw relief lines, even as a young man. And he was disturbed about that. He came from a middle-class family, but he was disturbed about it then. And even when he got ready to go to Crozer Theological Seminary out of Morehouse, when they asked him why he wanted to go into ministry, he connected it with helping people, get it, helping them deal with, with, with hurt and pain. So it's not new for King. King, um, King has always been concerned about that. I think it becomes sharp for him at the end because he's accomplished civil rights and the voting rights and now he sees that it's still he sees the city's burning right. and he wants to he wants to provide an alternative to riots. I want to play you an excerpt of the speech he delivered one year to the day before he was killed at Riverside Church here in New York City. I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. A radical revolution of values. Mm -hmm. The revolution in values is to see people first, to see Lazarus at the gate and not pass them by. So I think the revolution in values is, is Christian and it's democratic, but it starts with people. They have equal souls and equal votes, and we are very stubborn human nature about denying that and wanting to see anything but. Was it theological? This oh, yes, because people are created in the image of God. If you're created in the image of God, you can't treat people like things. If we are interconnected with each other, we can't treat each other like things. If America is concerned with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you can't have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness if you're treating others as things. So what was the turning point that moved him from an understanding of what you're talking about to an actual agenda of trying to achieve it? Well, I think part of it, part of it is a, a natural progression. If you are totally invisible, um, you're not even up to the level of a thing yet. The bus boycott, the sit-ins, the freedom rides, getting the right to vote, if you're not a citizen, uh, you're not even up to the table where you can start dealing with these issues. To me, Martin Luther King saw race as the gateway. If you can deal with race and the fundamental denial of common humanity through race, then it opens up possibilities, which I think happened in history. And finally, toward the end of his career, he said, we have an opportunity uh, now that we are learning at least the beginnings of treating each other as equal citizens to really tackle the, what he, he what he called the, the eternal scourge of racism, poverty, and war. His, his fight against poverty was multiracial. It wasn't just focused with black people. Well, you can't get that multiracial fight against poverty unless first black people are regarded as persons. So civil rights, that earlier part, is, as Taylor was saying, black people coming to the table. So after they get to the table, if you're going to deal with poverty, it spreads across races. So King was concerned about a multiracial movement against poverty because that's what the Poor People's Campaign was about. So that would help us understand the color blindness of that uh, 
economic and social bill of rights that he and the Poor People's Campaign developed in the first early part of, of, of 1968. The right of every employable citizen to a decent job, the right of every citizen to a minimum income, mm -hmm. the right of a decent house and the free choice of neighborhood, the right to an adequate education, the right to participate in the decision-making process, the right to the full benefits of modern science and healthcare. Quite a statement. And he had a, a, a workshop, one of the more remarkable events that never made any news and is not preserved in history, in which he had representatives of Indian tribes, mm -hmm. Appalachian white yes, coal miners, right. Latinos from, mm -hmm. of every different stripe. He had to do uh, hurry up education on how to tell a Chicano from the Mexican. His rule was if they are poor, have them here. And half his staff was, was revolting against that, That's saying right. we are a black movement. Why? Because they, did, they, they felt it would dilute the impact of... It would, it would exactly. diminish the unfinished agenda for, for black folks. It would diminish their expertise. Josea Williams, who was he, a lovely yeah, rascal. Yeah, that's <laughs> right, that's you know, right. He was strongly against it. You're taking my budget and giving it away to Indians and Mexicans. You that's can't do right. that. Yeah. But he had this incredible um, conclave there of people who didn't know each other and everything. And he said, I, if we can't... If we can't agree together that there's a poverty and a common approach to, uh, that's bigger than race, then we should stop now. But by the end of this thing, he had them all together, and and the and the rival Indian tribes were settling differences, and the Chicanos. Uh, uh, said, okay, well, we're going to let the Indians go first because they were here first. That's right. You know, and deferring. That's right. That's it, right. It was, a, that's it was right. a remarkable event. He was growing more impatient in the last few months and more radical. Let's listen to what he told those workers you were talking about in Memphis. Never forget that freedom is not something that is voluntarily given by the oppressor. It is something that must be demanded by the oppressed. If we are going to get equality, if we're going to get adequate wages, we're going to have to struggle for it. Now, you know what? You may have to escalate the struggle a bit. If they keep refusing and they will not recognize the union and will not agree uh, for the check off of the collection of dues, I'll tell you what you ought to do, and you're together here enough to do it. In a few days, you ought to get together and just have a general work stoppage in the city of Memphis. Well, that was a genuine uh, call to the barricades. Yes, it was. And, uh, but you can't do that without that inner freedom that he's talking about which is a freedom that empowers you to stop the work. It is the freedom inside that makes you do that. And for King, everybody has to claim that freedom. It's not a gift. Freedom is something that you have to demand from others, but you cannot demand it from others unless you have it internally yourself. And that's a kind of inner freedom. In what sense was he free? Well, King was free because death did not stop him. That is, the fear of death did not keep him from doing his actions for freedom. See, if the fear can stop you, then you are not free. So freedom from fear was crucial. And throughout the South, having grown up there, I know what that fear is like. And what is the most amazing thing for me is how King could inspire ordinary black people by the masses, like in Memphis, to march when white people have intimidated them for centuries. What King taught was that inner freedom that makes you confront the oppressor even if it ris means risking your life. So the freedom from fear 
is the necessary freedom to get the civil rights, to get the jobs, to get work against poverty, even though the odds may be against you. And for black people, the odds were against it. But here's the unfortunate thing. As you write about it, after his assassination, riots broke out across yeah. Memphis. And even though he acknowledged that, quote, riot is the language of the unheard, yeah. didn't this outbreak break of violence in some way be the, begin the end of the movement? Um, this is a very, very profound and difficult topic, yeah. and I would have to say that it had already begun before. Nonviolence was already uh, not popular. It had already become passe. Some of the most hostile language toward nonviolence came from the left, people saying that nonviolence is kind of Sunday school and outmoded now, and that we, uh, that we want to adopt the language uh, of violence. And King's answer to that was, Nonviolence is a leadership doctrine. If we abandon nonviolence, it's not that we're stepping up to demand the right to be just violent, just like first class white people. We're stepping back from a leadership doctrine in the United States. And that's what America, including especially white America, does not understand. One of the few speeches, by the way, in which a white leader acknowledged that was Johnson. Yeah. His, before he said, we shall overcome, he said, so it was at Appomattox, so it was at Concord, so it was at, at, at Selma last week when faith and destiny met in the same moment. So he was putting a nonviolent black movement not only in the heart of American patriotism, but in the vanguard heart of American patriotism. But do you admit that nonviolence ultimately didn't work? It couldn't change America? No. No, it Certainly did change not. America. It, change. it changed it radically for me. I grew up in Arkansas, and I know what fear is. What the movement did, nonviolence did, was to take the terror out of the South. And for the first time, you can not only go to hotels, but you can go all over the South without much fear of harm. That is a major achievement. Certainly, I recognize that. The white South was the poorest region of the country when it was segregated. It was totally preoccupied in this terror. Yeah. It was not fit for professional sports even until nonviolence lifted it out of segregation. And white Southern politicians were no longer stigmatized. So you get Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton and all these people uh, elected president. And they're all standing on the shoulders of a nonviolent black movement, whether they realize it or acknowledge it or not. That's the reason that our blinkered memory of this period is, is such a handicap for us today. Granted, but nonviolence did not bring about the economic restructuring that King hoped for so that today he could make the same speeches about inequality, poverty, uh, work that he made 45 years ago. Poverty is the, probably the toughest issue. You're talking right. about how much nonviolence, maybe two or three years. And for the time that it was active and, and, and that it matured in what is a movement, um, movement is a, is a word we use often, but don't re reflect on what it means. It was the watchword of politics. People were moved and literally moved history, but in a very, very short time. Now the watchword of politics is spin. You know, nothing's going anywhere and nobody's moving. And not since Martin Luther King has inequality been on the table the way it was after Occupy mm -hmm. briefly appeared on the scene. And I wondered watching Occupy from here, if a Martin Luther King had risen to embody that movement, would they have carried us further toward the changes that King and others wanted? It may would have, and I'm not sure, but you know, getting rid of poverty, redistribution of wealth is not as easy as getting the right to vote. The right to vote doesn't cost anything, but redistribution of wealth takes across class lines, that costs a lot, and people will fight you in order to prevent that from happening. And um, I don't know what it would take in order to make that happen. It's also not a simple formula. Dr. King never said we're going to give up freedom to have uh, uh, 
redistribution I imposed on us. Um, he never advocated something like that. You, it, it is a hard intellectual, spiritual challenge to figure out how do you preserve freedom and address poverty. I don't think Occupy got that far yet. It didn't take that much responsibility. It was just kind of a, a sign of protest and, and not, not a developed sense of uh, responsibility the way the, even the sit-ins were uh, taking lessons from Rosa Parks. Yes, that's right. Um, uh, the sit-ins disrupted the society. The Freedom Rides disrupted things. The city, the Occupy Wall Street didn't disrupt much of anything. They just camped down there. And um, they were, they were, they were not the grassroots in quite the same way the Southern movement was uh, during the time of King. King was identifying with labor and workers and felt that unions were an essential part of this civil rights struggle. I, I, I have this speech from 1961 when he told delegates to the AFL-CIO convention, our needs are identical with labor's needs, decent wages, fair working conditions, livable housing, old age security, health and welfare measures, conditions in which families can grow, have education for their children, and respect in the community. He felt this radical structuring that you talk about could not come without labor. And today, 45 years later, unions are largely impotent, mm. smallest percentage of the workforce. So what's happened to labor today? Labor has fallen in disfavor and fallen into, a, um, in some respects, uh, an intellectual vacuum because people take for granted the right that we give capital to organize in the form of corporations. Every corporation is a public charter. It is a creation of our people. Uh, it is a legal entity that we create. And the notion that, that people, on the other end, need some sort of vehicle in a global economy in order to, in order to make their rights effective uh, ought to be uh, an easy idea at least to begin a conversation with. But we're so frightened that anything that, that um, or I guess we're beholden to corporations in the way that people in the early movement felt that they were beholden to segregation, that their place in the order w w was threatened. If you start messing around with this thing, your whole place might, might go. That's how they marshaled a lot of uh, Southerners who were not in sympathy uh, with segregation into not being for doing anything about it. And so right now, I, you know, I think that we're, we're, we're hostage to our fears and uh, don't really understand uh, how we need to uh, think about uh, economics. The year before his death, this time he was speaking in California at Stanford University, he said, in the North, schools are more segregated today than they were in 1954 when the Supreme Court's decision on desegregation was rendered. Yeah. Economically, the Negro is worse off today than he was 15 and 20 years ago. And so the unemployment rate among whites at one time was about the same as the unemployment rate among Negroes, but today the unemployment rate among Negroes is twice that of whites. And the average income of the Negro is today 50% less than whites. Now Taylor and James, he could practically say the same thing today, 45 years later. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. And, and, he, and when he did it though, he could also say to American white people, you tend to think of black people as hopelessly caught up in the rear. The way you should look at this is that the things that are happening to black people, unless you make common cause, are going to happen to you too. The, the, the poverty rates, the divorce rates in families that were decried among black people now, the white society has long since passed. The notion that higher education is primarily uh, is harder for, for men uh, which is now afflicting white society. Most of our college graduates are females. That's been true in white and black society for years. And it has had uh, effects in the culture. So Dr. King said black folks are a headlight um, of, of the problems we need to deal with and white people too often just see them as something that needs to be left behind and, and, uh, and out of mind. So what would liberation theology say today about what Taylor just described? Well, you know, liberation theology came into being largely because mainstream theology had not spoken to that gap. So it was in the late 60s, early 70s, throughout the 80s, all the way up to the present day 
that liberation theology has its meaning primarily in seeing Jesus as one in solidarity with the poor to get them out of poverty. So in, in actual fact, what I see King as, as a precursor to liberation theology, I see King actually making liberation theology, particularly on the American scene, as real and true. And I think if he were here today, he would be trying to bridge this gap between the rich and the poor. He focused on black people, but it was always multiracial for King. To connect it to what Jim just said, I think that an awful lot of people today are fearful of the, the basic economic structure and it keeps them from thinking and, and rattling and getting together to address these problems. He said that King conquered his fear. I, I, I say it took him a while to do it, but he certainly <laughs> did. Yeah, yeah. Fannie Lou Hamer conquered her fear. Everything that she did, including testifying uh, as, a, as an unpolished woman before the Democratic Convention, she did when she was homeless. She had been evicted from her plantation, but she had gotten rid of her fear and had a vision that would empower and make productive whole generations of people who racism had denied. You know, so we have productive, we have an awful lot of productive people in the society today who are productive and educated and have talent because the movement helped people com conquer their fear, but we're now at another stage. Now it's hitting us, mm -hmm. and I think everybody is, is afraid to deal with these issues in the way that the movement dealt with them, which was, I'm going to let loose of my fear, I'm not going to worry about my, my savings and my wealth and whether my kids are going to get into Harvard, I'm going to deal with the basic issues of how, of how we can cope with these things together. Given the absence of a movement today, given the power of money, corporations, and the structure, what do you think Martin Luther King would say to those in power today? I think he would say, Something about you, this society cannot survive with the huge gap between the 1% and the 99%. When you have that kind of gap, then you destroy the possibility of genuine human community and showing how we are interconnected together. I pretty much agree with that. I think he would, uh, he would have to be saying, uh, don't give in to pride in thinking that it is solely your genius that's creating all these billions that you're sitting on. It is, you are reaping the interconnectedness that we have, and that interconnectedness is precious. And it is political, and, and, and it can vanish, and, and that can be, a, so you need to look beyond that. We only have two hopes, enlightenment, which comes from really wrestling and conquering your pride and, and appealing to the young, quite frankly, and catastrophe. That's the only other hard teacher that we would have, which is that we're going to ride this system into a catastrophe. Uh, and then we will wake up and say, why didn't we do it before? Why didn't we listen to Martin Luther King? Taylor Branch and James Cohn, thank you for being with me and for your thoughts and ideas. Thank you. Thank you.